Since December, the COVID-19 pandemic has posed challenges to governments globally. In China, health officials have announced Several they expect European to see the coronavirus outbreak into many lives. Now. But for some world leaders, this crisis has proven to be a useful distraction. COVID-19 as apparent cover. With nations busy saving lives and economy, the pandemic has become an opportunity for them to make undemocratic political moves that work in their favour. I will not hesitate. Shoot them dead. The Prime Minister says the moves, though, are essential to deal with the pandemic, but opposition groups and analysts warn they are undemocratic. In March alone, three nations, Hungary, Israel and the Philippines, saw their leaders tighten their grip on power. And it's a narrative that may not be unfamiliar to Malaysians at this juncture. At the beginning of March, less than two years after Pakatan Harapan took over the government, a new government was formed by the former ruling coalition. The transition of power was done behind closed doors. There were no elections and most of the members of the public were clueless. It involved MPs from both camps negotiating their allegiance, deciding whether or not they wanted to stay with the current coalition. This is unprecedented. Many have argued that it is also undemocratic. On February 24th, Dun Mahathir resigned. Following his resignation, it fell to the king to appoint a new leader, one that had the confidence of the majority from the parliament to form a new government. And so, as long as a party has a simple majority, meaning the support of at least 112 MPs out of 222 MPs, the leader will be appointed as Prime Minister. On March 1st, after consulting with the Royal Council, the King officially announced Tan Sri Muhyiddin Yassin as the new Prime Minister. But many argued he did not have the simple majority. Arguments aside, does our political system actually require a simple majority for a party to lead the country? Now, imagine if there are three corner fights in a 200-seat parliament. Party A, Party B and Party C. Party A secures 90 seats. Party B, 50. Party C, 60. In this case, Party A wins simply because they receive the most votes out of all three. However, this win does not actually give them the majority in parliament. This is because party B and C seats combined command larger number than party A's. And this system is called first past the post. Winner takes all. First past the post election, the winner could be just 34% if there's an evenly fought three corner. If you can accept that, the system is fine. If you think democracy has to be majority rule, then there is a trouble here. This is Wang Chin Huat, a political scientist. There's no consensus on this, and we cannot say first past the post is undemocratic. It's a matter of taste, I would argue. First past the post is a system we inherited from the British. And like most former colonies, we model our political system based on that of our former colonial masters. It worked well in post-independence Malaysia, when the Malay communities were more united, partly an effect of the divide and rule system. At the time, it was seen as a system that would benefit the winners, leading to a strong government. The idea of first past the post is that a political party will compete to the centre, sidelining parties on the extreme. So if you want to win, you would have to come to the centre. There's a phrase in political science for this. It's called the Median Voter Theorem, which is based on the bell curve distribution of population. But there's a catch. The catch is that our population is not one of bell curve, but one of M shape, a bipolar, meaning you have twin peaks. Why is it so? Because we have Malay Muslim form a big block, and then non-Malay non-Muslim as another block. So when you put them together on some spectrum, you don't find them converging. So in Malaysia, the relevant spectrum is not so much a strict economic left-right, but rather whether you believe in state powers to maintain uniformities and control, or you believe in individual freedoms to choose and compete. 
Malay Muslim stands to believe in state power. Non-Malay, non-Muslim prefer to have more individual freedom. What does it mean with an M shape is that electorally, centrist parties do not benefit. If you have a bell curve, centrist parties are the winner because they get to the middle, they capture the most numbers of votes. With M shape distribution, the party that goes to the middle will find itself punished because the system doesn't work for them. In a society with not too deep social division, it's easy for party to do that. Because people accept it and say, well, if my party is coming to government, it would have to be a little bit more moderate. We get back other things because we get a chance to implement some of our projects, our ideas and so on. But in a society with deep division, people start asking, are our parties betraying us? That makes moderation an electoral weakness. In a deeply divided society, moderation is like low-fat milk, decaf coffee, light coke, non-alcoholic beer. They might be healthier, but they are not authentic. Societal division is not unique. In fact, it's becoming a common trend. Part of the reason is because of globalization and immigration. And over time, societies become more sophisticated, forming their own ideals. 60 to 70 years ago, countries like Malaysia were seen as abnormal because we are multi-ethnic. At the time, people believed that normal democracy had to be of one people, speaking one language, professing one faith. Today, that has changed. In countries where a bell curve populations were assumed, we have seen how things have changed in the case of UK where Brexit shows that the population is so polarized, people talking about a middle ground does not get any support now. In America, another country where a bell curve population was assumed, shows increasingly an M shape is not as deep as ours, but the peak has been eroded so that you have a hole. And, and what you see for now, for example, Trump is much more right than the mainstream Republican in the past. And Bernie is much more left than the conventional Democrats in the past. Today, you find that countries are increasingly multi-ethnic. So in a situation as such, then you do find society become more polarised. And that polarisation often is induced by economic inequality. So, looking back, sure, there are a lot of issues with the way the new government transition took place. But what we also need to recognise is that the struggle goes beyond local political camps. The world is changing and our societies are changing. And it's probably time to start zooming out a little bit and perhaps change our political mindset and examine our democratic practice beyond mere binary. Chin Huat has a suggestion. Embrace division and overcome your disdain for politics. Modern democracy operates by having people who are divided and compete in a civil, rational and productive way. We would not get there if we are obsessed with unity. Go to the embassies of North Korea because that's the only country with perfect unity. Everyone loves the leader. In democracy, you're bound to have division. So get yourself comfortable with division. Embrace compromises and politics instead of thinking that these are dirty, dangerous and difficult. If you want to put it generally that our politics lacks one very important currency, decency. People have no principle, they have no honour, they can change their position not merely because out of political necessity, but because they were extremely opportunistic. I must say, politics without a little bit of opportunism is probably going to be troublesome because you'll be very rigid. However, when opportunism becomes the order of the day, you have chaos as what we have seen.